Yes, hello. I'm Jason Louv. This is the Ultra Culture Podcast. And that was the song I Surrender, a top 30 hit from 1981, recorded under the pseudonym Arlen Day by today's guest on the podcast, Alan Green. I saw somebody commenting under the YouTube video for that song that it's the best song Holland Oates never recorded. It's just phenomenal. So, Alan is a personal friend of mine, and he's somebody that I met in very, very strange circumstances, which we'll talk about in the interview. But let me just introduce him to you, because I think you're really, really going to enjoy our conversation. So Alan is just a fascinating guy. He's from Manchester in England, and he has had a, a long career in the music industry. He was signed by lots and lots of different major record labels. He actually used to be the musical director for Davy Jones from The Monkees for, for 12 years and actually wrote two books with him. And that was just the first part of his career, his, his, his musical career. There's a lot more to Alan than just music, though, a lot more. So, of course, you can tell that he's an, he's an, an amazingly, amazingly talented musician. But he's also a very, very sincere spiritual practitioner in the yogic traditions of India, which is how I met him. And even more interestingly than, than that, perhaps, at least for my current set of interests, Alan is a very, very keen scholar of Shakespeare and actually Dr. John Dee's work with Shakespeare in hiding a tremendous range of esoteric codes and coded occult information that Alan believes Dr. D directly hid in Shakespeare's work, working with Shakespeare and mathematical codes and codes about the secret nature of reality and codes about the universe. 
and it's pretty convincing. I sometimes my eyebrow sometimes sometimes raises about finding codes in things and Bible code type things, but the things that Alan has found in Shakespeare's work suggest pretty clearly to me that there was a connection between Shakespeare and Dr. D. Of course, Dr. D was Queen Elizabeth I's court astrologer and perhaps the greatest magician or one of the greatest or at least most prominent magicians in history and the subject of my new book, John D. and the Empire of Angels, which I actually began working on while living across the hall from Alan in the same apartment complex, not knowing that Alan was working on a very similar project right across the hall from me, which what can I say? It's just one of those bizarre synchronicities that reality throws your way every once in a while. So Alan and I talk a lot in this podcast about the esoteric codes in Shakespeare. We talk about Dr. D. We talk about spirituality and enlightenment and yoga and alchemy and Rosicrucianism. We, we cover a lot of ground. And Alan just really lays out his profound knowledge of, you know, some of the very, very secret parts of the Western esoteric tradition. And he comes at them from the perspective of the yogic traditions, which is also fascinating. So one word of uh, guidance up front before we get into the interview Alan at length begins to describe some of the codes that he's found in Shakespeare's work in the podcast. Now, when I was setting up this podcast with Alan, he he did tell me he was reticent to do this on the podcast. And the reason that is, is because he usually presents this material in video form. He, uh, he has um, a very specific presentation that he does with animation and PowerPoint and he has this incredible multimedia audiovisual presentation that he does to explain these codes that shows them very clearly. And you can very clearly and convincingly see the patterns and mathematical patterns that, uh, that Alan has found in Shakespeare's work that directly relate to, what, well, what he says that were put in there by Dr. John Dee using the Enochian tables and some of the codes that he received in the angelic sessions. So the idea that there's a connection between Dr. D and Shakespeare is has been suggested by some people, particularly Hakim Bey, but to find tangible evidence that they were, you know, that something was going on between them is a big deal, in my opinion. And to actually see that there were things going into Shakespeare's work, perhaps from Dee's hieroglyphic monad, and even the Enochian tablets is a really big deal. But I do have to offer this note of guidance, which is that when Alan begins explaining some of these codes, that it may be hard to picture or visualize. And the reason is that Alan really presents this material in visual form. So I recommend that for that part, or in addition to this podcast, please definitely check out his website, which is to be or not to be dot org, all spelled out, no numbers, to be or not to be dot org. And he's got a ton of videos there that are just amazingly well produced with great computer graphics and animation that really show his discoveries and, and make them clear so that you can really get them in a true way instead of just listening to the audio description. So hopefully you get the picture from his description of them. I think he does a great job. But I do I do I do say that with a caveat that his his medium is video, so definitely check out the video. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. I'm really enjoying getting back into the podcast and releasing episodes on a regular basis again. And I actually already have a ton of guests lined up already for the next few months. Some very, very exciting ones that you're really, really going to enjoy hearing me talk with and hearing from uh, on the topic of magic and in spirituality in general, and probably expanding into all kinds of unexplored and new territory going forward. 
So definitely make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast on iTunes uh, and on SoundCloud so that you can get the shows on a regular basis. People have requested that I get the show on Spotify. I would love to do that. I'm looking into how to do it. I'm not sure that it's easy to get because my podcast is hosted on SoundCloud, so there may not be an, an easy interface to do that. But if there are other venues that you would like to see the podcast in, uh, please contact me on Twitter. You can just send me a message on Twitter at Jason Louv. Definitely follow me on Twitter at Jason Louv. You can also follow me on Instagram. It's at magic.me, magic with a K. Uh, and on YouTube, the channel is called magic.me. And I also upload the podcasts there with video if applicable, uh, which I hope to do more of also, although we don't have video for this episode. So in addition to that, the current news is that my focus is totally on my course site, magic.me. That's magic with a K, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E, where I teach the full range of techniques for magic and personal spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. I'm really excited about that. I have a tremendous amount of new content coming. I've just announced a new feature, which is bi-weekly open Ask Me Anything sessions, where I'm having live video conversations for subscribers to the site uh, every other Saturday for about an hour in HD live video. We just did our first session yesterday. A couple dozen people showed up, all of whom are subscribers to the site, and asked some really, really great questions. And we had a great time. So that feature is now available to anyone who's a site subscriber. But I do need to say one thing, which is that I'm very likely going to raise the prices for the courses soon. And the reason is because my students are telling me to. Uh, lots of them and repeatedly are telling me that they're getting way too much value and way too much. And I'm doing too much for, the, uh, for them. Uh, for what the current price is, which which is which is low, so I'm very touched by this. My my students seem genuinely concerned for me that I'm working so hard and keeping the prices so low. So I'm taking that feedback very seriously, along with all of the other feedback that I'm getting from the students. I'm getting lots and lots of um, cues and useful information on how to make the site better, uh, which I'm going to be focusing on full time. That said, the prices are going to be raising perhaps significantly, likely within the next week to two weeks, depending on my workload and when I can get to clearly thinking about the prices. So what that means is the current subscription prices are the over the next two weeks, that's the last time you're ever going to be able to get that deal. Uh, and anyone, of course, who is a subscriber at the current rate will be grandfathered in going forward. It's not like I'm going to raise the, the prices on you. Uh, you'll be grandfathered in. But this is the last time uh, ever to get the current prices over the next week to two weeks. Um, particularly the yearly and lifetime plans, uh, I may even take away completely. Uh, and that lifetime plan, as it currently exists, is the best plan your or the best price you're ever going to get on magic.me it's just not there's not ever going to be a deal that good again so this is the way of the world expenses go up everything's more expensive for me now rent is more expensive for me now production costs are up etc and the students themselves have demanded it so that's what is likely happening along with that the site is going to get phenomenally better Okay, so that's the word for this week. So please definitely follow the podcast, follow me on social media, and strap in for a great, great interview with Alan Green. Okay, so I'm hanging out with my friend Alan Green, and we've just had an amazing hour conversation about, let's see, T, Manchester, and the secret occult codes <laughs> in Shakespeare's work, which... Alan has amazing, spent an incredible amount of time working out that they were put there by John D. Uh, and I'll let you tell him the story because he's going to do it much uh, better than my, my tiny summary there. 
But uh, Alan and I have known each other for what about five or six years now, and trying to remember what it was exactly, but it's around about that. Yeah, uh, we were living at, uh, across from each other in an apartment building in Los Angeles for you say five. I don't think it was. Five I think years. it was something like five years because I moved years? in in 2010. 2010, I remember because it was when I moved back to LA okay. for a job. Right. So it must have been. Well, it's 2018 now. So we've yeah. known each other for eight years. So you were there for four or five years. Anyway, we the point is we we never spoke. We would pass each other by by the laundry and whatever, say hi, and that was about it. And then all of a sudden, after years, we struck up a conversation. And I don't remember it quite the same way as you. You think I'd 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 actually seen a Google something some notification i don't remember that but anyway either way i we start chatting what do you do and you tell me you're writing a book on john d <laughs> and what are the chances right I mean, I'm, what? I'm writing a book on john d no we, we can't both be what <laughs> what are you talking about so get out of here it's great... my book i'm writing the book <laughs> on john d here's the great cosmic wink so i i had been on my side of the hall uh, working on the Enochian tablets, and you had been uh, here uh, on the other side working on the decodes in Shakespeare. Which and, are delivered to us through the Enochian tables. And just hap- we just happen to be neighbors. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really silly. And if you think about how many people in the world might be writing a book about John Dee, well, five, maybe, and two of them are living in the same apartment. <laughs> Literally five feet why, from each other. Why do you other. think this happened? I'm curious. I'm. I'm. I'm I just uh, think I'm it's slow the, to I think it's the divine like sense this. of humor. I, clearly, it's just. Come on, that is riotous. Anyway, so you, but you're you're focused on one element of John D that I'm not focused on, and I'm focused on an entirely other element of John D that you're completely unaware of. And I'm saying, do you, do you know that he, that he's actually he has. Through the angelic communications, mind you, they encoded something to tell you the true story about who Shakespeare was. And it's all decoded through this Rosetta Stone of the Enochian Tables. Hmm. Amazing. So I want to uh, get into your view of this side of D, but I thought we could start off at the beginning talking about you and your your background, your musical background, and how you came to the spiritual world, and how you became obsessed with this this corner of it. Obsessed? What do you mean obsessed? <laughs> well, it takes one to know one, right? So <laughs> I say this have, have, after having gone nearly blind. What are you talking for, about? For, obsessed for over uh, about a decade and a half looking <laughs> at Anokian tablets. So well, I've been at this fourteen years, eighteen hours a day. Uh, I have no life. I've lost a couple of relationships during that time, and I don't think obsessed is a very nice way to put it, okay. to be honest. Well, enthusiastic. Think, yeah, very okay. enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps a little obsessed. Yeah. So do you want to walk us through? <laughs> okay, well. So, so Alan, I have to say as an aside to the listeners, uh, Alan has a much quicker sense of humor than, than I do. So uh, I'm extremely literal. <laughs> quicker, and, it's and, one way of putting and, it. And uh, Alan is extremely Mancunian. <laughs> See, he just did it again. So so bear bear with me, please, while Alan runs circles around me during this conversation. No, it's not about that at all. It's about the fact that I'm not obsessed, Okay. <laughs> yes, I admit it. I'm completely obsessed. I have no, I, it's just uh, once it grabs a hold of you, you can't do anything about it. And it's great. It's actually a privilege and a joy to be working on this. But yeah, the funny thing is, I often think if I'll use the word God sometimes or the divine or whatever, but I mean, so bear with me if you're an agnostic or an atheist. Just let's say the universe has a sense of humor. And often I often think, you know, if this had been presented to me as it was years and years and years ago, and along with a sort of a contract to say, you'll be working on this for the next 15 years at least, and you won't have any sort of personal life, how do you feel about that? Well, I would never have volunteered, obviously. But the way it happened was actually really lovely. A friend of mine, uh, whose name's Michael Dunn, was doing a one-man show in 
Los Angeles called Sherlock Holmes Solves the Shakespeare Mystery, where, in which he portrayed Sherlock Holmes coming back from the dead to tell us in present day that he solved who Shakespeare really was. So he asks me along, he says, will you come along? I hated Shakespeare. I had no interest in Shakespeare. Never. Not the least. In fact, I had resistance to it. And this was 14 and some odd years. I don't know how exactly. It's less than 15, but more than 14. I lose track there, but around about 14 and a half years ago. And he says, <clears throat> will you, you know, and like you do with a friend, you say, well, oh, yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll come and support you. I didn't want to go. I thought it would be the most boring thing imaginable. But I went just to support my friend. And within 10 minutes, 15 minutes of him describing the untold story, the part that we're never told in school, that there is a mystery about Shakespeare. There is, uh, there's a lot of anomalies that make no sense, but the story is heavily resisted by the Orthodox, who have a multi-billion dollar industry around Shakespeare and therefore don't want to, you know, don't look behind the curtain, don't look at that, there's nothing going on here. So there's this entire structure that leads you away from this. If anybody says, oh, Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare, oh, conspiracy theorist. you know. But he outlined some of the details, nothing to do with codes, nothing to do with anything like that, but just the fact that the basics of the fact that the man who was born Shakespeare, and that's an important distinction, so I will use the word Shakespeare when meaning the man from Stratford. The man was born... Guglielmus, which is Latin for William, William Shakespeare in Stratford-upon-Avon, 1564, and grows up to be from this plague-ridden town with probably no education. We have no proof of him having any education at all, not even a basic grammar school education, though it is assumed he went to the grammar school, but that he goes to London and takes the whole city by storm. But nobody ever says we met him no one ever says oh you know i bumped into bill the other night down at the pub we had a pint no nobody says they <laughs> i mean the story is that since he certainly travel was restricted and was he never went to italy and yet half the plays are set in italy mm. oh he must have learned it from sailors in the mermaid tavern you know Sailors coming back from Italy talking about the Renaissance in Italy. You know, it's just not reasonable. He's the greatest writer ever. He never writes a letter to anybody. There's no letters. No letters exist. No manuscripts exist of in his original hand. Not a play, not a poem, not a letter, not a line, not a word exists in his own hand. Six very shaky signatures, all on legal documents, three on his will, that handwriting experts can't even agree were all written by the same person. So there's this massive, impossible to reconcile cover-up of how how did, how could that possibly be? We know that the, 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 he was being sought after for ta back taxes, and nobody could find him. So uh, the, he's the most successful playwright of the time. Twenty-five year career in London. Nobody saw him. So this led you to start thinking that, A, he didn't exist, and B, there must be a deeper uh, meaning at work or a hidden hand or hidden hands behind this individual. Yeah, not that he didn't exist. It's clear that the man from Stratford existed and that he was, you know, we have a certain amount of information about him. Mark Twain wrote a book called Is Shakespeare Dead? in which he made it his his uh, work to determine what we do know about the man from Stratford because he was a non-believer. He thought it can't possibly be this guy from Stratford. Um, and he compiled a list of everything that we knew about this person. And it's about 72 facts, which if you were to put onto pages, single spaced, it would take two pages to say everything that we know about William Shakespeare from Stratford. And that's what we are taught in school. Well, here's the man, and there's no, there's no information on him. But uh, 
he, he's the guy, and that, that's it. And he had no education. Maybe we don't know how he learned Latin and Greek and huh. French and Italian, and we don't know how he learned the classics or biology or mathematics or astronomy or heraldry or hawking and tennis and all these aristocratic pursuits and we don't know how he knows all these things like the back of his hand and it just reels off details above all he knows the law impeccably he knows the law and yet how did he how did he learn all this how does he know dance how does he know music how does he know horse riding how does he know hawking how does he know sword play how does he know <laughs> all these things right, that he writes right, about right. So anyway, a big mystery, and yes, he existed, that person existed, but there's a big, big, big question mark hanging over that had to have been some cover of why. So when did you first start to, so let me back up for a second. So my, and correct me if I'm getting some of the deta details wrong, but my understanding is that you had come from a background of, you know, this incredible musical career where you played with Mahavishnu Orchestra. And then no, I, I didn't play with them. Oh, no. I got it wrong. See? Yeah. Um, but you had come from <laughs> a musical background. Yeah. And maybe, so maybe say a bit about that. But also you had a, a prevailing interest in esoteric yoga and meditation. Yeah. But then coming, which is a pretty psychedelic background to come from, right? And then you, yeah. uh, and then this question became of overwhelming interest to you. All right. So prior to that uh, description of, of going along and supporting a friend that I talked about, uh, that happened about 15 years ago. Prior to that, I was, uh, I, all I had done my whole life was in music. And I'd been on various record labels as a singer, songwriter, and a pianist. Um, I'd been signed to various uh, labels, including Arista and ABC and CBS, and I had a, a small hit in 1981 uh, called I Surrender, but, you know, nothing major. And then at the same time, um, I met Davy Jones of the Monkees, and we became fast friends, and I ended up being his musical director for about 12 years and writing a couple of books on the monkeys. And maybe some of your listeners know them, and maybe some of them don't, but they were a, a massively successful pop group in the 60s um, who had a television series, and because they had a TV series called The Monkeys, and their big thing was, hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and they had a ton of top-notch writers like Neil Diamond, Carol King, Tommy Boyce, and Bobby Hart writing songs for them so that everything they put out was going to be a hit automatically. They were huge. In 1966, they sold more records than the Beatles and Elvis combined. So they were enormous, and then the TV show was stopped, and from then on they sort of carried on with a very, very enthusiastic fan base. The fans are the most loyal fans in the world, and they just kept on supporting them, and any time they took to the road, they'd do a tour, and the, the legions of fans would come out. So I didn't meet him during that time, but I met him in about uh, 79 or 1980, I think, and we ended up as I say, going on the road and being friends. So that was my background, um, all in music. Nothing to do with literature, nothing to do mm. with the idea of Shakespeare at all. But years later, once this bit me, this bug bit me, you know, I had been thinking for the longest time, I had done everything that I wanted to accomplish in this life. I had had my little hit record. I didn't, I was saved from fame to be, honest, because if I had become uh, famous, I'd be dead by now, I'm sure. Mm. I, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a good life for me. Okay. <laughs> I would. Okay. So I, but I, I was given what I wanted. Oh, I wanted that hit. I got my hit. And then I was literally summarily dismissed from having anything more to do with the music business. Uh, and I got married and became a father to a wonderful girl, Alana. And that was that. And I ended up pursuing 
well, writing. I got into this writing these two monkeys books, and they were both very, very successful. And they sort of started the desktop publishing industry, really. The, the, the first book they made a monkey out of me was literally the first ever fully desktop published autobiography wow. of a celebrity. Wow. Uh, and David and I went on the road pr promoting that, and all the fans turned out in legions, thousands. We'd show up at a book signing, and there'd be 3,000 fans there ready to, to, <laughs> to buy the book. So it was a, it was a wonderful ride. And I, eventually I end up here in Los Angeles, attracted very much to the spiritual path. I found my path, uh, I found the teachings that appealed to me, and was really sort of settling down to concentrate on that and decide I've got something, I, there's something brewing. I wasn't, I didn't know what it was, but I, having accomplished what I'd wanted to accomplish in music, I was thinking, you know, I could gladly leave right now. I mean, leave the planet, <laughs> but something going. <clears throat> and I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. And when I went to this show of where I was introduced to the Shakespeare story, I suddenly knew it. Oh my! Oh God! That's it! What a fabulous story! Huh. Huh. Okay. What a story! So you were totally resistant to the idea of even getting interested in this at all or going to the oh, show but then it, then it grabbed yeah, you when yeah. you went i went just out of out of courtesy wow. to my friend okay. hoping i could skip out at the end and not have to meet <laughs> him and tell him how bored i was okay. and i wasn't at all I and then just, your life changed I, I started working on a musical the very next day i said this is it this is what i should be doing i, I need to write the shakespeare musical and i, I wrote, started writing the next day and bent his ear for a couple of years because I knew nothing about it. And you could spend a lifetime studying Shakespeare, not, not just Shakespeare, studying the whole mystery that's called the Shakespeare authorship question. You could spend mm. a lifetime studying mm. that and never get to the bottom of it. You know? Fascinating. But I was writing it as a musical. After a couple of years, I had the musical pretty much mapped out, but I realized, you know, friends were saying to me, this sounds like a Da Vinci Code story. Why don't you write it as a book? Get that off the ground first, and then you'll be able to finance your musical. Because it takes an awful lot to finance a musical. It takes okay. millions, you know. So I kind of shifted gear, started writing it as a modern-day historical, not fictional, but historical story of what happened 400 years ago with fictional modern-day characters. And I got to the point where I was thinking, yeah, this is good. This is working. I've got it. And all I need to do, I had invented the idea that there were codes involved and that my heroine of the entire story would figure out these codes. And at the end, she'd go, got it. And the codes say this. And I had it all written. And I thought, the only thing that I need is, well, I don't know how they did codes in those days. I ought to do some study of that. Huh, okay. So I started to study how did they do codes during that time. And that's how I got introduced to, oh, John D was a cryptographer. Uh -huh. And he was the guy. So I thought, Here's oh, I where our man that. enters the story. Yeah. And I thought I also should go to Stratford <laughs> okay. and look at the grave and the monument and see if there's any codes there. So you've just done a <laughs> phenomenal amount of work, and, and you're going to have to go to Alan's website to, to fully see this, uh, dear listener, because Alan has done a phenomenal job of drawing out just, uh, it's, it's, it, we, we can't even begin to do justice to it in the podcast, and, and Alan uh, presents this stuff in you know, extremely uh, well-presented PowerPoint presentations and animated presentations where he goes through walks through and draws out all the codes, but the layers of um, occult significance that Alan has found in particularly his Shakespeare sonnets are just, I, I mean, mind-blowing. It's hard to put any other phrase on it. Uh, so maybe, but maybe, maybe walk us through a little bit of the codes that you began to discover and what they hinted at and then how John Dee uh, came to be involved in and how you realize that John Dee may have been involved in putting some of these codes in. Sure. I decided, well, I, I must go to Stratford. Two decisions. One was you ought to really, if you're writing this fictional historical book about what really happened back then, but fictional in the sense that it's modern day with modern day fictional characters who are the descendants of the real people who were in on the story at the beginning. That was the, that was the whole thing. And I thought, okay, well, 
yeah, it makes sense. There'd be codes. Let me at least study how they made codes in those days. And I started to read about John Dee. And the second thing was, well, I really should at least go to Stratford and, and look at, because I was beginning to suspect that if codes were left, then they might be in the gravestone of Shakespeare at Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, where he is buried. Um, so I went and I did my due diligence and thought, well, I've done a week's study. Now I'll come back and write the end of this <laughs> book <laughs> and make up some codes just for the sake of the book. I mean, if Dan Brown can do it, I, I can do it, all right? You know, he made up codes. I made a rollicking good story about the Da Vinci Code, so I'll just make it up. It doesn't have to be real. It's just part of, oh, that's how the whole thing comes to fruition. But having studied, I'm reading about John Dee, and I know I happen to notice that John Dee says in Monus Hieroglyphica, not one superfluous dot and not one dot missing. He's telling you in the introduction to Maximilian, is it? Yep, Maximilian the first. That he's he that he uses dots, punctuation in order to that's part of his device, his way. And well, this is not known in in modern cryptography. Everybody ad ignores punctuation, but I did. I knew no better. And my first introduction to it, Renaissance cryptography, was John D. So I thought, oh, I'll count. So I start counting, not just the letters, but the dots. And on the gravestone, I took a photograph of the gravestone, but I also got a rubbing, a life-size rubbing that they sell in the tourist shops of the gravestone. And I noticed there's a difference between the rubbing and the photograph that I took of the gravestone. And the difference is one dot. The actual gravestone has a colon after a certain line, and on the rubbing it's a period. And I'm adding everything together, thinking, well, I, I do, yeah, there's this. And by, the, by this point, I'm looking at, well, I know that the, there's a monument as well as a gravestone, so I'm adding up all <laughs> the characters in the monument. And I'm also drawn to something that many, many people had investigated. The sonnet's dedication is a very curious dedication. It's not like any other dedication in the entire history of literature. It makes no sense, and yet it has a dot after every single word. So that was, a, to me, a clue that, all right, do I count these dots? Yeah. So when I added up everything, it came to 623 characters, including the punctuation. Well, 623 was rang a bell because I had, by that time, looked at the Enochian tables, which had 624 mm. spaces for characters. And I thought, well, that can't be. They can't be that close. There must be. And then I look at the, the rubbing, and I realize, oh, but the rubbing is different from the grave. The actual grave has a colon, an extra dot. Bingo, 624. So... <laughs> so, so just so I'm clear on this, so the number of squares in John Dee's Enochian tables, the, the center of the Enochian system, is the same as the number of letters in... This, in the gravestone, the monument, and the sonnet's dedication, including all the punctuation. So Shakespeare's gravestone and the, and the sonnet. Shakespeare's gravestone, Shakespeare's monument, and Shakespeare's dedication to the Ooh. sonnets, 624 characters, including, as John Dee says in the Monus Hieroglyphica, Dots. So clearly we had nothing to talk about as neighbors. No, <laughs> no, we should just, uh, by the way, I think I've got a pair of your socks from the laundry. I'm hoping that's a joke, but. Yes, that was a joke. <laughs> can't, can't you hear all your listeners chuckling away? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I just thought I should mention that. That would be very embarrassing that, if I'd actually left socks. Uh, we all leave socks somewhere. Are there actually socks? <laughs> See, here's the thing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm very literal. I'm very literal. All right. Me too. So, and I was literally going, oh, my <laughs> God. 623 characters and the 624 in the Enochian tables. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a true story that I've, I don't think I've ever told, uh, certainly not publicly. I'm looking at John Dee and I'm thinking, well, there's this thing called the Enochian tables. You've got to find that because that seems to be... A lot of people think that the Enochian tables was cryptography. 
Right, 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 right. That it, and a lot of people say, no, 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 that's rubbish. It was nothing to do with cryptography. It was just the angel communications. What if it's both? And I lo I'm looking for a certain version of it that is, it seems to make sense to me because it's got the angel name Iom, I-A-O-M. And in Twelfth Night, Shakespeare says, has a code. And that code says it has Malvolio looking at a letter that's been dropped by Maria to convince him that he is loved by Olivia. So that's your setup. But, but Malvolio is a foolish character in Twelfth Night, and they're trying to make fun of him and make him think that Olivia, the countess, loves him. And he picks up this letter, and he's looking at it, and it's clearly a code. And he says, M-O-A-I doth sway my life. And he starts trying to work out this code. And he never works it out in the play. It's not intended to be worked out in the play. But a moment later in this letter, it says, If this fall into thy hand, revolve. Well, if you revolve M-O-A-I, it's I-A-O-M. And one of the angels in D's Enochian tables is I-A-O-M, but it's also the most sacred secret word of the Royal Arch Freemasons. And I only knew that from having read a book by somebody that actually revealed that. And typically, you know, these, these secrets are not revealed. I'm not a Freemason. I couldn't speak of it if I were, but because I'm not, and I read this book and got, oh, I-A-O-M. So... I'm reading anyway, and I'm realizing, well, the version of the of the Enochian tables that has that particular IAOM in it is a particular version that is called the, it's the version that was given by Raphael, where Raphael comes to... Uh, the re the reform the, table. The reform right, table. Right, right, right. And he goes, uh, look, uh, nudge, 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 wink, wink, uh, that, uh, that Enochian tables we gave you the other day, I want you to change it. I mean, just change a few letters over and don't tell anybody. Um, right. I mean, that's, and then you think, what's that about? That actually happens a lot during the sessions, though. When you go through basically everything that Dee and Kelly were given, they first, the angels first gave them, you know, allegedly, the angels allegedly first gave them uh, one version and then they come back and correct it. So it happens with the Lamin, it happens with multiple of the sigils. Yeah. And then it happens finally with the entire uh, great table. Right. But the version anyway that, I mean, again, you know, I would never have been blessed to solve this had I perhaps gone on to every other time they changed it. But the, the bottom line is there's a reformed table that Raphael says, and I love to put on this English Monty Python accent because it just seems so <laughs> funny that the angels would go, yeah, oh, I want you to change this. I, probably the angels didn't talk like that. Probably. I don't know. Um, well, all the know, angels I've know. spoken to have a California accent. Is that, is that, is that so? But, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another subject. So, um, but no, the, but it's just funny. And I'm looking for this particular book of the one that has the reform table. And it's by, a, a, it's in a book called by Skinner and Rankine. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, um, Rankine and Skinner. Yes. The Practical Angel Magic of John yeah. Enochian Tables. So I order it online. And you know, when you order something online, there's only one available. Get it now quick. And you order it and you pay your Amazon thingy <laughs> and you wait for it to come. This happened to me three times. It was supposed to be coming. And then I got an email saying, sorry, we thought we had it. We don't have it. I thought, oh, what a shame. I look around, order it again from somebody else. It's supposed to be on its way. I get an email a few days later. Sorry, we thought we had it. It's not coming. We issue you a refund. So in other words, it it's was very, very hard to get. And by, on the third attempt, I got it. And What I, year was this? This would have been about... 2009? Oh, uh, okay. Because I, I said, I would say you could have just come over and borrowed mine, but that was before, but I, I, moved <laughs> that was before I moved in. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was here all along. Right. But that was before I moved in. Right. So. Right. But when it finally arrived, and I swear to I swear to you, this is absolutely true. Take it for whatever. I'm not saying I have any psychic powers. I don't normally. But this book arrives in my mailbox and I open it and finally I've got it. And this, this book has been taking me a month to get it. And I know that this is the one I want because it's got the angel name in it that I've, well, I'd seen it online, but I wanted the book. And when I got it out of its envelope, I, I touched that red cover of the book and it was red hot. I touched the book and it was hot. 
heat was being penetrated to my hand. And I went, oh, wow. I wasn't like it was out of the sun in California. I mean, it was in, stuck in my mailbox and I touched it and I went, oh. And I really felt, yes, this is the book you need. It's one of the only oh. times that something, something as extraordinary as that has happened. Well, it's not many extraordinary things have happened surrounding this, but the only thing where I felt something physical, I went, wow. Anyway, and I get the book, and oh. I look at it, and I do the research, and I find, oh, yeah, yeah, this is it. And the gravestone, the monument, and the sonnet's dedication, the 624 characters go precisely into, a, in other words, I put them into an emptied out Enochian tables grid of the same pattern, you know, 24 across, 156 in each quadrant. And when the the key, you have to know a key when you're utilizing this sort of a substitution cipher. And I happen to know from other research that the key was double T, so TT. And there are five sets of double T's in the gravestone, monument, and sonnets, dedication. And there turned out to be that those five sets of double T's point across then to the Enochian tables, and they give you a message, an anagram. But the most extraordinary thing about that is that there are five sets of double T's in the Enochian tables, vertically, pointing back. And this never happens, never, ever happens in, in cryptography. That the, the ci what is called the ciphertext, that would be the grave, the monument, and the, the sonnet's dedication, is ciphertext. It's ciphered. It's pointing to what's called plain text. So the Enochian tables is the plain text that's, that's going to reveal what it wants you to know. Okay, so and maybe just a book, just to put a bookmark in that real quick, um, just to because I actually asked you this when you told me this the first time. So just for the listeners who may not know this, the difference between a cipher text and a clear text for those who don't know that um, cipher text and plain text or cipher text. Yeah, okay, and, plain text. Yeah, sorry. the cipher text is the text that the world sees. So in other words, it's. In this case, it's the monument and the gravestone. It's saying one thing, but really it's enciphered to contain a hidden message. You just need to know where is the plain text that it is pointing to that will tell you what it really is saying. And so the cipher text is that, and the plain text is the Enochian tables. And so, but... It's certain so letters. Meaning that the Enochian tables or plain text are the key to deciphering. Well, the, the key code. is the is the double T. Where wherever you find a vertical double T in the cipher text, when it's okay. put into the grid, that the way John D put the grid together, that was, you know, channeled to him by angels on uh, June. 24th, 1584, that's the day that it's, it started to be channeled to him. Well, the double T's in the, I, this is hard, this, it's hard to describe, isn't it? Because most mm -hmm. of my work is very, very visual, so if you could see it, it would be, you'd get it in a snap. But having to describe it, it's, the, there are, you look for a double T vertically pointing across two, two letters in the Enochian tables. And then you say, oh, well, it's pointing to those letters, and those letters say something. And then, But it turns out that in all of cryptography, there's no such thing as the key, the double T, existing in the plain text as well, pointing back to the cipher text. And that's what happened here. And so the double T's, I noticed that it is exactly the same situation in, in the in the plain text of the Enochian tables, pointing back to the cipher text of the grave, the monument, and the sonnet's dedication. And that gives you another part of the encoding. And then, because in Twelfth Night, Shakespeare gives us this clue, revolve. If this fall into thy hand, revolve. Turn the whole thing around. Well, we know from J John Dee's other writings that he loves to do that. He loves mirror imagery, and he loves to then invert things, and that's part of his modus operandus. So 
So, okay, maybe that's what's happening here. So you turn the entire grave monument and sonnet's dedication upside down and point it to the Enochian tables the right way up. And the double T's there are now going to point to completely different letters. Mm. And the double T's in the Enochian tables are going to point back to completely different letters. And what wow. it ends up giving you is living page, your stigmata, I have hewn desiderata. Living page is a way of saying there's a page, a document has been kept alive, preserved, maybe living page. Yo is a medieval word that means look at, but it has a very specific meaning of really pay attention to. It's not just look, it's really, really look. If you want to tell somebody to really pay attention, it's yo. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so yo, stigma. I got that one being California, and that, that yeah, that you translated. got that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, uh, you're probably a big hip hop fan, as am I. Uh, yes. And um, but anyway, but yo, yo, and the word stigmata is self-explanatory, but it's not a word we tend to think of in this day and age much. But stigmata are Christ's wounds on the cross. Two. Wounds in the feet, two in the hands, and the spear in the side. There are five stigmata wounds. So if a clue is saying, there's a living page, yo stigmata, I mean, look at the stigmata wounds. Where are the stigmata wounds? There's only one place there are stigmata wounds in any church. And this church where the monument and the gravestone are, Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, where Shakespeare, Shakespeare is buried, it's on the Holy of Holies altar stone where Mass is celebrated. That's where you have to have five stigmata wounds carved into the altar stone. So it's telling you very clearly, look at the Holy of Holies altar stone. The next line is, I have hewn desiderata. I have hewn, the word hewn has only one meaning, cut into stone. So... Look at the altar stone where I have cut into stone. Desiderata is a Latin word for my desires or what I want you to know. Living page, your stigmata, I have hewn desiderata, is telling you there's a page, there's a document or some kind of communication preserved, kept alive. Look at the stigmata wounds, that's the Holy of Holies altar stone, where I have cut into that stone what I want you to know. It's absolutely dead clear. And, and there's an altar stone right behind the grave and the monument in Shakespeare's church. And that was then, that became my goal. I had to, well, it, he seems to be saying he's put something in that altar stone. And I then embarked on having to cultivate the church for four years. I visited the church about six times in four years and became their friend and helped them in many ways, trying to become not just some stranger lurking around saying, hey, I want to get a look at your, you know, I mean, they're not going to take kindly to that. So I, 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 I did a lot to help them. I designed a calendar for them to sell in their gift shop to raise money for whatever they might need money for. I talked with the vicar about, I was doing a Davy Jones uh, charity concert there to raise money to, uh, yeah, they're always looking for money for the celestial windows or whatever. So, I love this part of the story, by the way, because this is a true. This is the truly Indiana Jones part of uh, <laughs> uh, what you're what you're leading up to. Is, 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 is the truly Indiana Jones part of your uh, your quest? Mm. Well, there was no way of getting in. Obviously, but, 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 I mean, I've got to get into the altar. How am I going to do that? So, I I spent four years, as I say, cultivating them. Now, I mean, I don't want this to sound as though it was all um, just a uh, you know, plots have I laid, Richard the Third kind of scenario, but but yeah, plots have I laid. I laid plots, and because <laughs> okay. I had to. I mean, I knew the truth was there. I knew it was in the altar. How are you going to get inside a three-ton altar stone that is bolted to the altar in the back of the church that is under constant CCTV surveillance and has a chemical a spray system hovering over it that if you get in there and you're not supposed to be there, it sprays you with a chemical that will 
stay on your body and your clothes for a year. Oh and my it has God, a sign, I didn't know about this part. It has a, they have a sign outside the church saying that this, this, this system is in place, 100% uh, conviction rate in court, it said. Everybody that's ever tried to steal anything <laughs> from the church has been found because they can't, you know, we, we just then scan them with a with a colored light and we say, oh, there's the chemical on your arm. You're busted, mate. Oh, my God. So you can't get in there. You can't just go in and say, can I, can I scan your altar, please? <laughs> um, when I say scan, I mean radar scan because it's a bloody three ton marble block it's nine foot by three feet by a couple of feet deep how are you going to get to it you know so uh i i i spent that time really getting to know the people there they're beautiful people i it, well it wasn't that i mean i was they don't know what they've got there they don't they're not deliberately sort of part of the cover-up they just they're trying to run a church but you know the the Bottom line is, they still they charge two pounds to come in and look at Shakespeare's grave. I mean, it's a church; you should be able to just walk in. But you get up to that a certain point, you're not allowed any further. Donation, please. You want to see you want to see Shakespeare's <laughs> grave? It's there by the altar. Oh. So anyway, I spent all that time trying to get to be in their good graces and. Uh, gradually, they let me do things like film uh, in the chancel, and I filmed the altar, but uh, still was not the same as getting into it. So what I did was I uh, arranged, I, I'd written this musical, so I said to them, you know, I'd very much like to present my musical to your congregation on Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd, the biggest date in the, in the entire Stratford calendar, when the church will be full and we'll get a terrific audience and... And they said, yeah, sure. Now, because I was performing, they had to switch off the uh, the chemical sprayer. That wouldn't be very good if I'm sitting at the piano playing uh -huh. and I'm sprayed with a chemical. So that was that got that part taken care of. The other thing was, though, there's 24-hour CCTV cameras, and so I had to disable the CCTV cameras. Now, the way you usually do that in a spy movie is you get on top of a ladder and spray it with... <clears throat> uh, some sort of uh, spray can thing, black paint. And I thought, yeah, that will look a bit obvious if I'm there spraying the CCTV cameras. Can't do that. <laughs> so what we and did... Whether you, you actually had that train of thought, by the way, of, of whether you should spray Should we the spray CCTV the cameras? CCTV cameras <laughs> so that they can't see us radar scanning their altar? <laughs> Not a good plan. It might work in Oceans 11, 12, and 13, but no. Not in real life. So, um, <laughs> so uh, what I did was during the dress rehearsal, we put up a banner advertising the musical called Bard. I made it here at home and shipped it over when we went over on the flight. And it was a banner that was, I think, about yeah, 12 foot by 10 foot in five strips. And we erected it at, during the dress rehearsal, put it in front of the altar so that we were advertising the musical, <laughs> but so that nobody could see the altar. Got it, got it. And then we brought in equipment, filming equipment, because I was filming us <laughs> doing the performance of the musical. And within that film equipment was were a couple of pieces of equipment that nobody would notice, and they wouldn't know that it just looks like film equipment. But one of them was a ground penetrating radar scanner <laughs> as you do as you do you right. know you bring it well we'll probably need a scanner so we rented a scanner from leeds and we got trained in it and we got a person who could operate it and everybody was signed to non-disclosure agreements and some time to do the to sing the song that i wrote for i, I wrote the music to sonnet 18 shall i compare thee to a summer's day and i'm performing that and I said, let's let's ha turn off all the lights in the church and have it in complete darkness. Let's do this by candlelight. It will be so atmospheric and so beautiful and so dark. And that's what we did. And we put candles around the piano and on the grave. And while I was singing Sonnet 18, I had a radar scanner and a person, a camera person, filming the scanning of the altar 
in night vision because she couldn't do it. In, I mean, it was completely dark. So when you look at the actual film of it and it looks like um, a SWAT team in Afghanistan, you know, wow. doing the night wow. vision thing. It's all green and, and we're filming so that we had proof that we'd done it. Otherwise, nobody would believe us. So we scanned the altar. Three minutes, I sang the song, scanned uh, across the surface of the altar, never even touched it. We put down a protective coating onto the altar so we didn't damage anything. And when the whole thing was over, everything was packed up and we had the 400-year-old mystery on a little, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a drawing a blank. Well, what was in, what was, on what a, did you discover? A, a little, what was inside the altar? Yeah, but I want to get this, uh, got it on a, a little chip. SD you know, card. SD card. SD card, card. okay. Yep. Let me say that again so you okay. can edit that out, so I don't sound like an no, idiot. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you won't anyway, you'll leave it in, it's okay. No, go ahead, I'll change it. <laughs> so we it's just ended more work up, for me, that's all. <laughs> um, so, at the end of it, we scanned it, we got the whole thing on an SD card, took it to our hotel, sent it via uh, the internet to two of the leading radar labs in America. And that was it. It was done. We walked out. We didn't, we didn't take anything except zeros and ones. And two weeks later, we got the results. And the results were uh, that w both labs worked independently of each other. And what we should, they said what you should see if you said we didn't tell them where this was, we didn't tell them what we had scanned. We just said it's a rock, and we suspect it's got a hole in it. Can you tell us if we're right? And they actually called me up and said each individually because we we were testing one against the other, so there could be no uh, collusion. That's a very popular word these days. <laughs> yes, no collusion with the Brits or <laughs> with the radar lab, and so. They called me up and said, uh, Mr. Green, you, this, uh, this radar scan, you said you were looking for a, a very a small hole. You see, a consecrated altar stone should have a tiny hole in it. It should have a little hole about the size of a small child's shoebox, which contains relics of a saint. And that goes along with the whole carving, the incising, the five stigmata wound crosses on the surface of the altar stone. At the same time, they cut a hole into the stone from underneath it, and they put in a tiny, tiny box called a sepulchrum, and inside that is what Rome sends over as relics of a saint. A few slivers of bone, maybe a bit of parchment that the person wrote on, whoever they say is a saint. And then you seal it up with the same rock that was carved out of it. The whole thing is sealed up. And now it is fit to have the mystery of mass celebrated at that stone. It is now called a consecrated altar stone because it has the stigmata wounds on the top and the tiny little box inside. So that box should be a certain size and perhaps, you know, four inches by six or seven inches by a couple of inches deep. Fairly small compared to the overall size of the entire stone. And they called me up and said, we thought we were looking for a tiny, uh, tiny, tiny uh, little space, but we don't understand this scan. It, the, the stone is basically hollow. <laughs> okay. And I went, yes. Because <laughs> I knew it was. I knew that if they had gone to this trouble to tell us in code that there's something inside this altar stone, it has to be something pretty darn important and big and... You know, why on earth would you go to all that trouble to invent this massive code? And what are you, what is there? I mean, I don't know what's there, but the obvious question comes to mind. Well, there are no manuscripts. The greatest works in literature, Hamlet, Midsummer Night's Dream, Twelfth Night, Macbeth, they don't exist. Perhaps it's those. I certainly know it's the sonnets because the codes say so. In Other codes say the sonnets in the, in the original hand of the author are there. But the question is wide open as to what is actually hmm. there. But they said, we don't understand. It's enormous. Wow. And wow. when you look at the actual results of the scan, uh, the calculation is that it's about 200 to 250 times the size it's supposed to be. Wow. So just to reiterate, re reiterate so I make sure I'm clear on this. So you discovered these codes in 
the sonnets and the monument and the gravestone. You deciphered them. They pointed to the stone. You scanned the stone, and the stone was empty. Not empty, hollow. hollow. The, 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 uh, yes, the, the result me, hollow. Is, is that it shows a cavity that's 250 times the size it's supposed to be. I say 200 to 250 because we only had time to scan half of the altar, but extrapolating from what we have seen, it's, it's certainly a couple of hundred times the size. And it's probably 250 times the size. That means they had to have gone to an enormous amount of trouble to carve it open. Now, it's not empty because in the results of the scan, you see different striations of color, which indicate different densities within that cavity. So there's something in there throughout, but the overall picture is this great big blue area that suggests, wow, there's no stone there. The stone has been cut away. And it's been replaced with something else. Okay. Paper, so the, the code whatever. showed the X marks the spot on the treasure map, and mm -hmm. then you went there, and the treasure was there. It's there. We just, now the next step is, how do you convince them to open it if their multi-billion dollar tourism industry depends on you not knowing that there's any mystery at all? Let's not look behind the curtain. Pay no attention. There's nothing to see there. And that is, that's what we're actually facing. You know, the biggest mystery in all of literature is in a place, and I've proven it scientifically by actually radar scanning it, and I've, the codes themselves prove it, but nobody would listen to just the codes, so I had to prove it scientifically. So both have proven that there must be something there. Shakespeare left something deliberately for us, the man who left no paper trail, that there's an entire cover-up as to who he was, who, what his identity was, where all the paperwork went, where everything went, there's nothing. And yet, he's telling us, look inside that altar stone. And when we went and we looked, we found that there is, that, that's it. So the whole, <laughs> the whole push is to say, well, we should open it, shouldn't we? I went later to the church to ask them if they would consider scanning it. I didn't tell them I'd scan it because I knew if I asked them if I could scan it, they wouldn't let me, and then the game would be up. They'd say, oh, this guy wants to scan the altar. Don't let him in the church ever again. So I scanned first and then went to them, and to be honest, I went and asked, and if they had said yes, yes, we think we should uh, scan it, I'd have said, well, I can save you the trouble because I've already done it. And I would have turned over the scan to them. It's absolutely truth. I would have said that because all I wanted them to do was simply open it in, in public. And let's find out what Shakespeare left for us. But the answer was I, would, I got blocked every step of the way. Well, I don't think, no. And the, when I finally saw the... the uh, the Bishop of Coventry, who is the man who would have the authority to say yay or nay on something like scanning an altar stone, he said he would have to take it to a higher authority. And that was in 2012. He said, I'll get back to you. Well, it's 2018, and he still hasn't got back to me. And the only higher authority, higher authority there are only two higher authorities. One's the queen because she's the head of the church, and the other is uh, God. So I think maybe he took it to both of them, and they were both busy. <laughs> okay. Because they did not get back to me, which I knew. I mean, they weren't going to come back and say, yes, Alan, let's scan the altar and find out the whatever's in there. We don't. They don't want to find out what's in there because their entire story rests on it being the man from Stratford, and why would the man from Stratford have gone to, why would there be an entire cover-up of all this zero paper trail, and why would he hide something in the altar stone of his own church where he's buried and say, look there, I've left something for you? So they don't want to know. 
Now, it may well be. I'm not saying that it is somebody else. I do believe it is somebody else. But even if it were the man from Stratford, shouldn't we just go and find out? Shouldn't you put the crown on the right head? The, the Stratford is dogged by this terrible conspiracy that ho that hangs over them and has hung over them for a couple of hundred years. People saying, it can't be this man, it can't be him. It had to be somebody tremendously knowledgeable, somebody protected by the court. You know, all of that question could go away for them overnight. They could open that altar and say, oh, here's proof of who he was. And if it's their guy who they say it is, they say there's no chance of, of it being anybody else. In okay. which case, they should just open it, but they're not going to open it. The only way we're going to get it opened is by appealing to the public to vote, which you can do at the website www.tobeornottobe.org. Okay, so that's critical to go there. But I'm curious, let's talk about the why. So having discovered all this, what are the implications of this? And I want to definitely touch on some of the deeper codes that you found in terms of divine messages and... Uh, things pointing to the Great Pyramid and things like that in the sauna, because this was not the end of your search. You kept uncovering deeper and deeper layers of code. But yeah. let's start first by, I, I want to ask you, what are the implications of this for the identity of Shakespeare, for the story of Shakespeare, for and the, the deeper meanings that you've drawn out from this? The implications for the story of Shakespeare are what I've briefly touched on, and it's very simple. It, he's either the man from Stratford or he's somebody else. And if we truly love Shakespeare, we just ought to go and find out. I mean, there, there should be no political reasoning and saying, oh, let's not find out. because I mean, he's left, he's, he's, he's left something for the world, and he says he's left something for us. And it's been embedded in codes that John D. helped to put together for his friend, the real Shakespeare, whoever that was, whether it was the man from Stratford or whether it was somebody else. And my own personal feelings are not really pertinent in this. It, 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 the question is, it's there. Shakespeare himself has left something for us. There are millions upon millions upon millions of Shakespeare fans who, once they know this story, are going to say, yeah, come on, well, let's open it. Why, why can't we open it? It's not as though it's even a uh, uh, desecrating a holy relic, because in fact, in as I say in the first book, Decoding Shakespeare, that altar stone had been desecrated during the Reformation. So that's a long story. I won't go into that. But the basic thing is the, the stone itself was already desecrated. So the church really has a spiritual obligation just to open it anyway and reconsecrate it, because you shouldn't be celebrating mass at a desecrated altar. Right? Are my prayers answered? What about my Aunt Agnes? Is she still in purgatory? I, you know, I mean, I'm not meaning to make light of it, but it's a very serious issue. The spiritual obligation of the church should be, yeah, let's let's just get whatever's in there. If there's something in there that's not supposed to be in there, that itself means desecration. So they should take it out. So we should. There should be no problem with that, but there is a problem because of the political angle of we don't really want to know if there is some other story to Shakespeare. The other side of it, when you say why, why would whoever it was go to this length? That is to do with the deeper meaning of the codes. And all I can say without showing you, you know, there are examples at the website, but without you actually seeing it, is to say that it's a deeply, deeply spiritual message the message over and over and over again is saying something that would have been very dangerous for anyone to say back 400 years ago, heretical, in fact, to the church. And that also then gives a reason as to why this had to be encoded and covered up. There are mathematical codes on the title page of the sonnets, geometry that by connecting the dots, literally D's device again, the dots are important, by connecting the dots, the punctuation on the title page of the sonnets, you, <laughs> you see f a perfect circle connecting all the points and six perfect right-angle triangles within them. And the right-angle triangles, when you 
measure the ratios of the lines in the triangles. They're all on a common hypotenuse. But the other lines, the two other lines, they give you pi. And they give you phi, golden ratio. They give you Euler's number, E. They give you E minus 1. They give you the Euler-Mascheroni constant. You don't have to understand what these are. All you need to know is that these are phenomenally important math constants. They are the most important mathematical constants that we know of today. And five of them were not even known back then when the sonnets were printed. And yet they are on the title page of the sonnets. So, again, that's John Dee. John Dee was the great mathematician, the great cryptographer. The, and, and behind all that, he had a spiritual message. And, the, and in the poetic side of the codes, along with the mathematical side of the codes, they're pointing, I know this sounds like a stretch, but they're pointing to the great pyramid of Giza. The, the, literally on the title page of the sonnets are the geographic coordinates of the great pyramid. And you say, well, why? How, 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 that's not possible. But yeah, it's there. And you can't deny it, it's there. I mean, the beauty of this is it's math. You can say you can bury your head in the sand and say, I don't want to know that it's there, but it's not going to go away. It's there. <laughs> we, if you're a scholar, if you're at all interested, you should be saying, how on earth did Shakespeare and John Dee know the geographic coordinates of the Great Pyramid to within yards? And why? So there's your why again. Why? Well, there's a lot hidden in the Great Pyramid that we would be well served by studying because it is the most perfect building on the face of the earth and we can't build a building equivalent to it today. We cannot. Look into it. Do your research. You can't. There isn't another building that is so perfectly aligned to true north. We don't have the technology today to build the Great Pyramid. But it was built, and here's Shakespeare saying, look at it. Specifically, look at the king's chamber. He gives clue after clue after clue after clue, saying, look inside the king's chamber at its mathematical perfection. Well, I've been there a couple of times to double check, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, of course it's, it's mathematically perfect. And it, it, is, it turns out that it is expressing exactly the same 12 constants that are on the title page of the sonnets are embedded in the Great Pyramid proportions, exactly the same. So there's a connection. And if we could understand that connection scientifically, we would probably be in possession of some very, very important scientific information that we do not have right now. And my suspicion is if he went to that much trouble to leave poetic clues that tell us something's in the altar and mathematical clues to tell us something's in the altar, then what's in that altar is both poetical, probably some of the great works of literature, and... I can only speculate, but some, <laughs> something about the science of the Great Pyramid that we don't presently understand that could be of infinitesimal use to us now. I'm not going to speculate what that might be, but all you need to do is look at <laughs> the speculations of Whoa, who built the pyramids. Did they know stuff we didn't know? Yeah, they certainly did. They put, you know, <laughs> two and a half million blocks of stone perfectly aligned some of them in the king's chamber weighing 50, 60, 70, 80 tons, perfectly aligned, perfectly seemingly laser cut. So, you know, there's something there that it's hard for us to grasp, but there's something there. And he's telling us he knows what it is and he's put something there, so we should open it. The why, the overall why of that is, and I can sum this up in only a couple of sentences, honestly, alchemy. 400 years ago, they called it alchemy. John Dee was an alchemist. We have a distorted view of what alchemy is. Alchemy, we think, is, oh, turning lead into gold. But its true meaning, the spiritual meaning of alchemy, is turning the leaden ego into the gold of the soul, yes. the spirit. And that's the message. And so you've got poetic codes, art. You've got mathematical codes, science. Right brain, left brain. And alchemy is the balancing of those two to give you enlightenment, unity consciousness, the perfectly balanced brain of left and right, getting rid of the dualities of earthly life, 
going towards the spiritual nature of unification, of unity. And so Shakespeare gives us that clue over and over again in the codes. He gives it to us in the plays. In, again in Twelfth Night, he says, it's all one, it's all one. He has a character, a drunken character, walking through the play saying, it's all one, it's all one. And the clown saying, that's all one, that's all one. Apropos of nothing, it's, he's saying, it's all one. Balance through alchemy, which today we call yoga, the left and right sides of the brain, and you will come to unity consciousness. And he's using that as a metaphor for really enlightenment. So whether it's through scientific knowledge or whether it's through great works of art, we can achieve that heightened state of enlightenment, of recognition of our divine unity. And that's the message that he's giving. And he's giving it not just saying it's all one, but in the most recent things that I've discovered that John Dee has just stunningly put together, he's saying, you, you are it. Not just I am. I mean, it's all very well to think a master came. Perhaps Shakespeare was some master. Perhaps he was a divine being. Perhaps John Dee was some master, a divine being. I think they were. But the message is, you are. When you think of it, it's the same message that every great avatar that's ever come to earth has said anyway. Whether Christ or Buddha or Krishna or... And it doesn't matter. They all say the same thing. Christ said, no, you are not, that ye are gods. Well, you, all these things that I've done, you can do too. But the church wants to say, no, 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 no. You can go only, only... <laughs> you only get there through this particular person. So I'm not going to go in, into depth on that, but the point is his message 400 years ago was one of unity, unification. I believe John Dee was actually trying to reconcile the terrible political asp aspect of what was going on at the time uh, of the Reformation, you know, from the old faith to the new faith, and uh, killing everybody. It was a mad time in England, wasn't it? Yes, if you, absolutely. If you were, absolutely. If you were a Protestant, Oh, you could be burned at the stake by the Catholics. If you're a Catholic, you're burned at the stake by the Protestants. You know, we'll just burn you, okay? I mean, we disagree. Our God's better than your God. Well, and here's D in the middle of it trying to say, no, no, no. The, the whole idea of the Rosicrucian movement, which was central to this, is the, the, the reformation of, that, of the unity of the old religion, saying, no, 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 we're all one. It's all one. What Shakespeare is saying over and over again. And he gives very many, many clues in Hamlet. You know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is <laughs> Christian Rosenkreutz and the Knights of the Golden Stone. It's the Rosicrucian Manifesto. So it's all tied together with this supposedly secret organization called the Rosicrucians, of which John Dee was certainly a very, very important member, as was Sir Francis Bacon. Hmm. Well, let me ask you this. For somebody who is interested in what you were saying, enlightenment and unity consciousness and alchemy now in 2018, what is the best way for them to pursue that? Well, I've got a bridge in Arizona that I'd like to sell you. <laughs> and Here if, comes you, the if you buy <laughs> it, you can get my 12-step lessons as to how to become completely enlightened. Now, it'll only cost you <laughs> 50 pounds, two and six I per lesson. I should have known not to, to not be so direct. Uh, well, you're asking me what? The best way for somebody to get enlightened today? Well, this is what I'm asking because <laughs> we're, we've been talking about this secret tradition spanning ancient Egypt, Shakespeare, D, the Ro Francis Bacon, the Rosicrucians, and these are very, you know, these are not concerns that change. These are not concerns that go away. So bringing this up to the modern day, uh, these are these are not things that are somehow less accessible to people now. I hope than they were in the past. So for somebody who is trying to, well, become enlightened, right? Why, uh, you know, you've, you've got some experience of this, I take it. Uh, Forgive me for, for, for that, for, for the flippant remark. You know, it, it, it's that old question, isn't it? I mean, 
I, I'm certainly not here to proselytize. Um, and I, I, I just can't. I would not do that. It's just wrong. I'm not going to say, well, you should follow this path or that path. I, I, I would say that there are many, many, many paths available to us now that were not. I mean, we were talking about an age for only 400 years ago, which was, which was the end of the Dark Ages, and they were burning books and burning people. And now... I don't know. If you look at the news, it doesn't seem an awful lot better, but it must be, right? Overall, we don't just we don't just burn people. We just um troll them online <laughs> and say Yes. Yes. <laughs> we just send out the trolls. But <laughs> but if you are interested, you can find any path you can find if someone is interested in in in, in finding a more peaceful enlightened way of living well it's not it's not an extraordinary thing to say well perhaps you might try meditation because certainly i think everybody understands that yoga meditation today is 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 a very beneficial thing even if you just want to d d improve your health yeah but there are paths and i'm, I'm not i'm certainly not going to uh, promote one over another but just to say you go looking read what interests you about that and if, if you are sincere you're going to find something that resonates for you and you will then i think the only thing the only important thing is to say don't just expect it to come over the weekend right i mean when we are infinite beings the universe is going to be around for an awful long time time has been around for an awful long time whoever's doing this even if it's only mathematical forces whatever's doing this seems to have their shit together yeah i mean it's beautiful it's in on in many ways don't look at the news the news is a mess but right, you might want to look at a right across the hall and talk to your neighbor. You might want to do <laughs> that, Jason. <laughs> you know, and I always say that I, I, if you hadn't been so stuck up and not wanting to talk, we'd have we'd have sorted this out a long time ago. But you know, you were just unreachable then. You were just um, I, okay. I'm doing it again. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it again. You haven't please, said that before, actually. Please, right? so you haven't you always listeners, said that, unless it was to yourself, uh, stewing on this side I'm of the hall. I'm an ass. <laughs> I am. I'm just. I, I can't help it. I and but no. But seriously, to the serious thing is just, just you. You know, it's not gonna. You're not gonna find it overnight. But just commit to something. Say, well, I think I'll, I'll give this a shot. I mean, that's what I did. I, I literally, I knew I wanted to find something. I found a particular path that taught a certain form of meditation. I, it's not for me to say what that is because that would be wrong. It would be proselytizing. But you can pick it from many and say, I just, I want to learn about this. Pick one that it seems to attract you. But give it a year. That's all I'd say. I'd say give it a year. That's what I did. Because I, I was in rock and roll. You know, I was living a very dissolute life. You know, I'd heard of of, of things like um, alcohol and uh, and drugs. I, I I never did any of it, you know. But I mean, I'd heard about it. <coughs> Excuse me. There's that bridge. There's that bridge in Arizona. Um, you know, I mean, but I was living a dissolute life and thinking, well, I done this is not very satisfying. And I found a certain way of meditating. I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll commit. Come on, I'll commit to this. And 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 I didn't have to give it a year. I gave it maybe six months, and I was feeling so wonderful and so blissful and so peaceful. I thought, wow, this really works. Uh, not to say that it's like that all the time, but you will be rewarded for that commitment, for your own sincerity in saying, I want to find something that helps me. Whether you, you don't have to call it God, you do not have to call it a religion. Please don't call it a religion. But there are many methods of, of meditation that are called scientific techniques of meditation. And they are scientific in the sense of do this and that will be the result. Science. It, it, it's, it's, it's very true. I found it to be true. 
And so I just, I would say that you, you will find something, commit to it. Don't just say, oh, I, I don't know. I want it in 140 characters. No, I don't think there's a, a spiritual path that you can get tweeted to you. But <laughs> unless it's, <laughs> maybe there is. Shouldn't limit the limitless. But no, but just that's, that's what I would say. Because that is what Shakespeare is saying. That is what many great ones in all kinds of areas of what we would call religions of the world are saying. But we're now in a, in a, in a time and a place where we're realizing perhaps all these boundaries are falling away. It doesn't, again, from the news perspective, it doesn't look all that promising. But it truly is in many, many ways that we are realizing, oh, yeah, there's truth in every one of these teachings. Let me get to the the truth of it. And in fact, there's that word, you know, we were just talking earlier tonight. <laughs> what is the word that John D has embedded most in all the codes? And I'll, it is, it is, a, it is the word, the Latin word via, which means true or truly or truth. And he embeds it in within the extended word devir. And Devir is the Hebrew word for the Holy of Holies in Solomon's Temple, which housed the Ark of the Covenant, which kept the Ten Commandments. And that is every Holy of Holies from then on, and that was the first temple of Jerusalem, every, every church that has a Holy of Holies has that as the focal point when you walk into the church, you're going to look at that holy altar. Well, this is where Shakespeare's left his message, inside the Holy of Holies. And the Hebrew name for that Holy of Holies is Devere. Now, that might give you a clue as to who I, who I think is the real Shakespeare. But, <laughs> but the Devere is a word that dates back, what, thousands of years. And yet a person incarnated at that time called Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, who was clearly part of this. And I, in saying that, I do acknowledge also Bacon's role. I think Bacon was a part of this, and I know that John Dee was a part of this, not as a writer, but as the encryptor and the scientific mind behind it. But all of this rolled into one. You get to see the word that he is constantly saying is Vere, truth. Shakespeare himself says, truth is truth to the end of reckoning. It's a very, very comforting and powerful statement, isn't it? No matter what the world looks like, no matter what you think is going on in the news and the politics, he says, truth will out. And truth is truth to the end of reckoning. Reckoning. In other words, it's not going to change. It's not something that was truth and now we've got a new truth today. It's the same. It's all one. It always will be and it will come out. Truth wins in the end. And that's his message. And his central part of that message is you are that truth. You have that within you. It's an amazing, amazing message. And it is, that's, that's what's so exciting to about working on this is a great privilege and joy to be working on it, to be finding these things almost every week. I find something that goes, oh my God, he said that, wow. And it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, but the message is always, always, always the same. Truth. It's interesting, isn't it? It's not even the word love. You'd think, you'd think he'd be saying, all you need is love. <laughs> Truth. That's somehow mystically, hmm, it surpasses even the I, that airy-fairy idea of love, isn't it? It's just truth. Wow. Very deep. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, uh, well, that's a good, perhaps a good place to put a bookmark in it. And... For someone to find out more about your work and learn more about you, where should they go? Well, the website is www.tobeornottobe.org. Now, that I, I must stress, that's not 
There were no numerals in that. <laughs> I sometimes give this out, and people start writing out down, you know, as though it's the artist formerly known as Shakespeare. Two, the number two, B, the letter B. No, it's not two and B. It's the way he wrote it, T-O-B-E-O-R-N-O-T. D O B to be or not to be dot org. Now that is that's a holding area where right now I am I'm going to be launching a Patreon site in about three months time, but I don't have a name for that yet. So essentially just go to the website and there'll be information there and updates as to how you can get to see all of this information. Because really I do have YouTube videos and the and the the ones that are the the most the the most easily accessible, I would say, are, the, are one is called Bard Code, B A R D C O D E. And if you look up Bard Code and my name, Alan Green, you'll find the video on YouTube that shows the geometry that I was telling you about on the title page of the sonnets. That to me is the most easily convincing right away because you can't, you just can't argue with it. It's not, it's not down to interpretation. It's just there. You, you, it, it's, it's beautiful, it's elegant, and it's there. And from there you'll find uh, other things. But ultimately, um, I am going to be launching an episodic version of all this. One of the great sadnesses in my heart at the moment is that people, in, in general, tend to not want to read books these days. It's not true entirely, but it's pretty common. And I think the most, the way that people can access this, because it is so visual, I mean, we've been talking here, but it's far easier when you see it visually. So I will be putting literally dozens, scores, probably ultimately hundreds of short videos, five and ten minute videos. Uh, some of them will be free and they'll be on YouTube and some of them will be on the Patreon site where where I would be inviting you to just help support this work if you feel it's important. But either way, you will get to see a, an awful lot of free stuff that is on both of those sites. And it's a way of getting into it that's easy. I mean, just to see something, say, oh, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Mm, let me see the next one. And they're not going to be long. They're going to be maximum 10 minutes. So it's not a huge commitment. But hopefully there'll be that ongoing thing of, oh, well, I want to see the next one and the next one. Because there is a lot. But you can certainly get an idea of it from just investigating what I've told you about already on the website excellent and i'll link all that in the show notes also thank you yeah. so alan thank you so much for having that chat my pleasure jason it was great to catch up with you and i think uh same to you you know you're working on a, another side to john d that people really are going to be blown away by your work and then connecting it to my work and there's other we were just talking about there are other people getting interested in John Dee. There's already been a musical about him. And there's, I mean, nothing's caught fire yet. But the truth is, he's one of the most fascinating characters in history that we don't really know a lot about. He's had a bum rap, really, right? Because he was definitely sabotaged. Uh, but... He's the original Dumbledore, for God's sake. <laughs> He's the original Merlin. He's a guy yeah. with a long white beard wearing, you know, magician's robes. He's the great cryptographer. He's the great mathematician at the time. He's 007, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. He's the first on Her Majesty's Secret Service spy in Europe. It's where Ian Fleming got the idea from. I mean, he's he's appealing on so many levels. To, I mean, kids are going to love the fact that he's a wizard. He's a freaking wizard. Yeah. <laughs> and he's talking to angels. It doesn't get much better than that. It doesn't. He's It's crazy that we don't know about him yet. Well, that's why we can have conversations like this. <laughs> yeah. And open, and open it up a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Thanks so much, pleasure. Alan. My, my, my pleasure is all mine. And until next time. <laughs> all right.